I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Listening for What Matters, Lessons About Caring from Concealed Recordings of Medical Encounters. I'm Andrea Greenberg, Communications and Partnerships Associate at the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare and your moderator for today's session. The Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare is a national leader in the movement to make compassion a vital element in every patient-caregiver interaction. Before we begin the formal presentation, let's go over a few details about the webinar. The Schwartz Center Compassion in Action webinar series is funded in part by a donation in memory of Julian and Eunice Cohen. Today's program will be 60 minutes. The first 45 minutes will be presentation, followed by a 10-minute question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded and will be available on the Schwartz Center website a week after the session. Please note that attendees are participating in listen-only mode, but can interact with the speakers by using the questions pane, which should be appearing on your screen. If you have questions, please just type them into the questions pane and send them to us, and we will address as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. As you exit the webinar, you will receive an electronic survey that we ask you to take a minute to complete so that we may capture your assessment of today's program. Your feedback is re really important to us. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and our host for today's session. Dr. Beth Lown is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Medical Director of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. Welcome, Beth. Good afternoon. Thank you, Andrea. And thanks to all of you for joining us for our 2016 webinar series on Compassionate Collaborative Care, or what we're calling the Triple C. In January, during the first webinar of this series, I introduced the Triple C model and its associated attributes and behaviors. I described some of the science of compassion and empathy and discussed why compassion is a source of reward and an antidote to burnout. The framework explains some of the key values and skills that help us offer compassionate collaborative care to patients, families, colleagues, and coworkers while sustaining ourselves and our sense of happiness and meaning in work. A full description of these qualities and skills is available on our website. Each month, we offer a webinar by experts on different aspects of the compassionate collaborative care model and framework. And this month, we're going to be discussing contextualizing care, which is really all about active listening and eliciting information about the whole person within the context of his or her real life experience. So Dr. Weiner will tell us how by recognizing and asking about clues you receive from your patients that indicate they may be struggling in managing their health, you as clinicians can adapt their care to meet their particular needs and circumstances. So today's program will show how this impactful approach can help patients have better healthcare outcomes and less overuse and misuse of medical services. Today, we're honored to have as our speaker, Dr. Saul J. Wiener, Deputy Director of the VA Center of Innovation for Complex Chronic Health Care and a professor of medicine, pediatrics, and medical education at the University of Chicago, Illinois at Chicago. So welcome, Dr. Wiener, and I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you, uh, both of you. First of all, thanks to Andrea Greenberg for getting us started, and also to Dr. Beth Lone for the nice introduction and brief overview. As we advance to the next slide, I want to talk briefly about listening for what matters, lessons about caring for, for, from concealed recordings of medical encounters from the standpoint of how I got to this particular stage in my career. Uh, where I was audio recording uh, healthcare providers, uh, really by the thousands. Um, it all started, I would say, in the 1990s, at a time when there was uh, a tremendous interest in the concept of evidence-based medicine, which, of course, has become a commonplace term these days. Uh, people talk a lot about the importance of following guidelines and best practices, and we still do that. But one of the things that I started to know, notice, uh, I would say around 1999 or so, when I was a junior attending, and was essentially supervising a lot of medical students and residents, is that many of them, while terrific at this whole business of knowing the guidelines and the best practices, were somehow missing something about 
the information that came across during their interaction with the patient. And what would often happen is they would come out and talk with me about a, a patient. Uh, the the uh, clinical presentation was clinically consistent with their care plan. Um, there often would be some comment they might pass on to me uh, casually, like uh, this individual is uh, looking forward to having the surgery so they can take better care of their son or something like that. And then I would walk in and meet with the patient and uh, start to ask them questions. Uh, I might ask them what was going on with their son, and a story would pour out. And what would all of a sudden happen is that the care plan would all of a sudden no longer make sense. Um, it, it made sense before you knew the context. It made sense before you knew what was going on with this individual, but it no longer made sense once uh, you actually had the backstory, what I call the patient context. So if you think about it, this sort of inappropriate care is a kind of medical error, and we've come to refer to it as contextual error. And the other thing you'll notice is that you really can't pick up on these errors unless you're listening in on the visit. So in today's webinar, I'm going to be walking you through a series of studies and lessons we've learned uh, from, from this process. So moving on to the next slide. Well, okay, as, as you can guess, um, Aaron James here is not a real patient. This is actually uh, an actor. Uh, we trained somebody to play Aaron, Aaron James, and we sent him on many, many visits. And uh, let's look at what happened at one particular visit. So he comes in to see a doctor, and the physician at the, at the point of service thinks that they're seeing a real patient. They know some of their patients are going to be fake, but they don't know which ones. So Aaron James is a 42-year-old man whose asthma flared up after he lost his insurance and could no longer afford to take an expensive brand-named inhaler as prescribed. He didn't mention that he wasn't taking his medication every day. At one point during the visit with his doctor, he commented that, boy, it's been tough since I've lost my job. The doctor replied, I'm sorry to hear that. It's been a rough economy lately. Do you have any allergies? Well, Mr. James left that visit with a higher prescribed dosage of a medication he, could, he already could not afford and a referral for pulmonary function tests. So let's just pause and, and, and discuss what's happened here. Uh, this is, of course, an actor. Um, he's coming in with a common ambulatory presentation. Um, when he walks out, he's got uh, a prescription and really a care plan that looks good on paper. After all, if you were the physician uh, auditing this chart or the nurse uh, utilize, utilization review person auditing this chart, you'd say, well, you know, his, conditions, his condition asthma had exacerbated and he was put on a higher dose of a medication. But if you were a fly on the wall, if you were in there listening, you would realize that there was a comment made by that patient that was critical and that got missed. Okay? As you might surmise, this is somebody who's lost their health insurance and isn't able to pay for their medication anymore. So now let's look at what happens when this uh, same, same actor goes um, into a different visit with a different doctor. So again, he's Aaron James, um, asthma flare-up, and uh, he, uh, same comment, boy, it's been tough since I've lost my job. So this time the doctor replies, I'm sorry to hear that. How has it been tough? Is it affecting your health care? Well, Mr. James reveals that he can't afford his medication. So our actors were trained to be very forthcoming. If they were asked a question, they simply asked, answered it. And what evolved during this particular audio recording was that the physician soon learned that the person's asthma, that this gentleman's asthma had gotten worse because he had lost his health insurance. He was taking his medication every other day, stretching it out. Um, the, the doctor then essentially put him on a much less costly version of that medication that he could afford and he left with um, what I would call a contextually appropriate care plan. Now, how often do you think the first scenario plays out, and how often do you think the second scenario plays out? Well, we sent this particular case to 50 physicians, and we did a lot of different cases like this, so I'm going to talk about a few. But what happened with this particular case, patient uh, in, in, in a variety of visits is that in only about 30% of the visits did he leave with a care plan that addressed the reason for his asthma symptoms which was essentially that he had, uh, was unable to pay for that expensive medication and there were much cheaper alternatives ever since he lost his job. So why do you think this occurred? When we listened to these audio recordings, the most common thing that we heard was something we didn't hear, which is that the physician never asked the question, well, how has it been tough since you lost your job? In those visits, in the minority visits where the physician got the case right, he or she did have to ask that question got a forthright answer. And that, by the way, did not necessarily guarantee that the patient walked out with the right care plan because sometimes what happened 
is uh, Mr. James would explain that he'd lost his health insurance, and for some reason he would still walk out with a more expensive, uh, with, with a higher dose of the same uh, medication that he already could not afford. So let's look at another um, unannounced standardized patient case. And just to give you a little bit of a heads up of where this is going, um, we, we did this work, um, hundreds of these visits. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going over some of these um, uh, findings with you. Then we're going to move on to a second phase of our research where we started inviting hundreds and then eventually over 1,000 real patients to carry concealed audio recorders in their visits. And I think you'll be very interested in seeing what we learned when we did that and how that type of work was a little similar and a little different from this. Um, you're also going to hear a little bit about how we expanded beyond just doing this um, with uh, physicians being audio recorded and started audio recording uh, nurses and pharmacists and um, um, uh, actually front desk clerks. Um, so uh, for the vast majority of you who may be listening to this webinar, you're probably going to hear something that, that is relevant uh, to work that you do. So anyhow, let's get back to Mr. Gregory Garrison. So this, uh, again, this actor was a, a, um, an older gentleman. He was in his 70s in real life. Um, he uh, also went on about 50 visits. In this case, he came in saying that he was um, uh, losing weight. Uh, he, wasn't, uh, he, he, had he also mentioned that he'd lost his job as a security guard. Um, he, had been, uh, he didn't tell them, of course, that he was intermittently homeless, but he actually was in, in the scenario. Um, and uh, that the reality here is that he had been unable to get um, a good meal three times a week. Now, I'd like to pause here and just share with you that we didn't actually make up any of these cases. Um, uh, we uh, drew on clinical um, uh, patient care situations that we, my, my, I and my team had encountered as primary care doctors, and then we turned them into cases. And we actually had a fairly elaborate process for uh, vetting them and making sure that um, they were valid measures of physician performance. Um, but uh, what was interesting about the real Mr. Garrison, who of course was not named Mr. Garrison, is I actually met him as an inpatient. I had just come on service as an inpatient doctor, and this was a gentleman who'd actually been worked up for unexplained weight loss. And um, when I came in to see him, he was uh, getting CT scans and colonoscopies and all sorts of stuff. Um, and it came out in conversation with him that he was, uh, that he was hungry, uh, that he uh, uh, basically had been um, calorically deprived, um, and he was food insecure, and essentially um, uh, the workup was not appropriate. Um, he, what he really needed was uh, uh, social services, meals and wheels, and that sort of thing. So we turned that into Mr. Greg Garrison here, um, sent him off on lots of visits to primary care doctors in the Chicago area, again, always with their permission, um, but again, with them out, without them knowing when they were being visited by these fake patients. And um, uh, so he was trained to give four indications that he might be food insecure and homeless. Um, well, in this particular visit, um, this particular audio recorded visit, um, the physician did screen for depression. It occurred to the physician that weight loss could be caused by depression, um, but the, he did not screen for food insecurity. And because uh, the default uh, for patients who are uh, losing weight and you don't know why, particularly if they're older, is to do a malignancy workup. So order a CT scan, a colonoscopy, a chest x-ray labs, and so forth. Now, as you can imagine, this gets pretty expensive. Um, and so these errors are not, uh, are not cheap. Uh, they're expensive errors. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the costs associated with uh, with these contextual errors. All right, so Mr. Garrison now, uh, same actor, goes off um, and uh, visits another doctor. Same story, um, says that he's been losing weight since he lost his job as a security guard, um, doesn't mention the homelessness part, and so on and so forth. He's wearing ill-fitting clothing. Um, this time, the physician asked the patient if, if he's having trouble accessing food. Uh, the patient replies, well, I do get over to a soup kitchen at the church every, um, over, the, over, by, over by where I'm staying a few times a week, but I hardly ever get a good meal otherwise. So uh, in this particular situation, um, the physician um, identifies that uh, food insecurity is the problem, um, consults a social worker, and refers the patient to Meals on Wheels. So as you can imagine, this is a patient who's going to get appropriate care and obviously less costly care. So again, Mr. Garrison made about 50 such visits um, portraying the same case. Um, and in only 30%, 37% of these did he leave with a care plan that addressed the reasons for his, uh, for his weight loss. And uh, the most common reason, again, was something that he was not asked, which is, are you having trouble getting enough food? So I just want to comment that the opportunity to talk um, in the context of the compassionate collaborative care framework um, that Dr. Lone introduced um, should be 
evident, I think, to many of you that, that what we're looking at here is a kind of practical form of compassion. Um, one of the ways you show compassion is by being curious, being curious about what a person might be struggling with and asking them the right questions. Um, and it's practical because it's really essential, ultimately, to making sure that they actually live with appropriate care. And in fact, what's striking in uh, particularly if you think about the asthma example, is a lot of doctors said, yeah, I'm really sorry you've lost your job, it's a tough economy, et cetera, et cetera, and they may have felt like they were being empathic, but then they just went on with questions like, do you have allergies? So they were really kind of going down their own checklist, and their, 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 their friendly comments about, you know, it's been tough and so forth, um, while they might make the patient feel better, they don't actually help the patient in the sense of um, guiding the, 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 the encounter in a a direction that's ultimately going to be effective. So let's just talk a little bit about what we mean by context. I think we all have a context, and I think one of the things that's happened uh, as a result of the evidence-based healthcare movement is there's a tendency to think of everybody um, in, in the context of the randomized controlled trial. Um, and if you think about it, a randomized controlled trial has no context. Context has been washed out by definition. It's an average. Um, and so there's a tendency when doctors see patients, and you'll, you'll see other healthcare providers too, some more than others, to just forget that they have a context. So um, where did these doctors go wrong? Well, interestingly, both of them, I'm talking about the ones who got the care plan wrong, uh, provided appropriate biomedical care. Um, in the case of Mr. James, the first example, um, you can see that uh, the doctor stepped up therapy, and that's guideline concordant care for poorly controlled asthma. And for Mr. Garrison, a malignancy workup is guideline concordant care for unexplained weight loss. And certainly, if you were auditing the chart in both cases, you would conclude that the doctors did the right thing. But neither was appropriate for these particular patients, given their particular situations. And that's really what we mean by a contextual error. So they never asked about what might be going on in their patients' lives that could be relevant to their care. So there are three terms I want to introduce you to. I've been actually using a few of them, but I want to just pause and define them. Uh, they're very helpful constructs for the purpose of this conversation. Um, the first is just patient context. So patient context um, is everything expressed outside the boundaries of a patient's skin that is relevant to planning their care. It's a very precise definition. Um, alternatively, you could say it's the patient's circumstances and behavior. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about examples, but obviously um, losing your job is a uh, context when it's relevant to uh, an inability to afford your medication. Um, certainly, working the night shift, uh, it would be relevant to perhaps getting to an appointment on time or taking your meds uh, if you're diabetic at the point where you're supposed to in relation to your meals. So these are all things that happen outside the skin. Now, I think it's also important to mention that it's everything expressed outside of the boundaries of the skin. So for instance, if a person is depressed and that depression gets in the way of their managing their diabetes, it's going to be part of the context of manage, managing their diabetes. That person is probably not going to do a good job managing their diabetes until somebody addresses their depression. So it's part of the context of the diabetes. Of course, if they come to you for depression and their symptoms are depression and you're just going to treat that, well, that's a biomedical problem, but it's part of the context, the failure to self-manage a chronic condition. Let's now talk briefly about contextual error. I've been using that term quite a bit. Um, it's, of course, an inappropriate care plan that results from inattention to patient context. And then, of course, contextualized care is the option. You get the care plan right, not just because you knew the science, you used the right research evidence, but because you picked up on the contextual factors and you adapted them into the care plan. So I'd like to pause here and talk about essentially 12 domains of context. And I think that this sort of laundry list is a useful, I wouldn't say something to tack on your refrigerator, but something that you might want to keep around. Um, we actually started out with 10 domains of context, but eventually uh, we ended up doing actually a validation study and coming up with 12 domains of context. So these are essentially, if you, if, if, from a clinical perspective, these are like a differential diagnosis. When you're um, interacting with a patient and something is getting in the way of an effective care plan. There's something going on in their life. You're not sure what it is. It's going to fall into one of these 12 categories. So let's just pause for a minute. So competing responsibilities. People get jobs. They lose jobs. They have sick children. They have a sick spouse. All of these things 
can get in the way, of, particularly if you have a chronic condition, of what had ordinarily or previously been well self-managed care. So somebody comes in and their diabetes used to be well controlled and all of a sudden it's not well controlled anymore. Well, um, what happened? What happened in their life? It's very unlikely that their pancreas suddenly went out of whack. Um, this is an outside of the skin problem. It's a contextual problem. Something's changed in their diet. Something's changed in their ability to uh, manage their medications, uh, to, to exercise and so forth. So wh what's going on? Well, it could also be a loss of social support. That's domain number two. Uh, for instance, it may have been that they had somebody who was helping them. Let's suppose their vision, vision isn't very good from diabetic retinopathy and somebody's been helping them dose their, dose their syringe, syringes and now that person is no longer available. Well, that's a loss of social support. Um, it could be an access to care issue. Um, so you can imagine, for instance, that um, uh, you've got somebody who um, used to have transportation to come in and get their Coumadin checked and, and no, they no longer have that transportation. Uh, that could obviously wreak havoc uh, for somebody who's managed for, say, atrial fibrillation. Financial situation, we already talked about that. We saw an example of that, of what happens when somebody is not able to afford a medication. Skills, ability, and knowledge. Um, that includes um, just literally skills. The, a, a, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis might have a lot of difficulty uh, dosing a medication, like using a syringe, for instance, or um, their vision may be failing, or they may have cognitive deficits, or they just may not have adequate health literacy to understand a care plan. Emotional state. Remember, I talked about the fact that depression, um, while it is a biomedical problem, it can become the context for another condition. It can become the reason why another condition has stopped um, uh, going well. Um, cultural perspectives and spiritual beliefs. That's a very broad set of, um, there are many, many factors within the, the, that domain. Um, environment. Um, you know, you want to quit smoking, um, but your, your, your roommates all smoke, um, and it's, 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 a major um, contextual issue for you. Um, uh, attitude towards illness, um, relationship with healthcare provider and system, or resources, health behavior, those are the others. And I think uh, if you were to sit down, you could probably make quite a list of the kind of contextual factors in each of these domains. So you'll notice I'm using a few terms here. These are domains. The factors are the actual um, factors in a person's life. So uh, um, uh, the uh, inability to um, make it to an appointment on time because one works a night shift would be a contextual factor in the domain of competing responsibility. Um, showing up late for appointments would be um, the clue um, that there's an issue. We call that a contextual red flag. So we've developed a little bit of a language here, and you'll see why this language is important for tracking how healthcare providers are doing at uh, attention uh, to context. So now let's look at a research project that we did. This took, um, uh, good goodness, uh, three and a half years, I think, to do this project. So we hired a team of actors. Um, we trained them in these various scripts. Uh, we had them conduct uh, 400 um, undercover visits to over 100 physicians. Um, with, uh, and again, you, I think you now have a good understanding of how we did that. Um, these, uh, the physicians contextualized the care plan in only 22% of these encounters. When, uh, when essentially picking up on the clue, the contextual red flag, um, and uh, addressing it in the care plan was essential. Uh, so what that means is that in 78% of those cases, there was a contextual error. Now, lest you be overly horrified, I have to confess, we, we designed these cases. Um, in, in a sense, we, we, um, we were testing the, the physicians. In other words, every one of these cases contained a mistake to be made. Now, in reality, and you'll see a reality in a few minutes when we move to real patients, not every case not every encounter between a healthcare provider and a patient is dependent on picking up on context. Some, some situations really are very straightforward. Um, but as you'll see, a fair number of encounters do really depend on picking up on these contextual factors. Um, and so when we sent these uh, actors in uh, with um, essentially these contextual red flags, in only about 20% of the cases did the physicians pick up on these and address them. And I will tell you, uh, that we actually vet these cases pretty carefully before we use them. We went through a rigorous process. Um, actually, it's cited here um, in, uh, on this slide. Uh, you'll see that we went through a rigorous process where we essentially um, tried these cases out on, a, on essentially a panel of board-certified physicians uh, in, in written form and made sure that all of them agreed independently that these contextual factors uh, would warrant changing the care plan from the standard best practice. The last bullet point here is a really intriguing one. Um, so this uh, is a, tells you a little bit about how expensive these errors are. How did we do this? Well, as I mentioned, when we sent these fake patients out, 
um, we essentially um, uh, didn't tell the doctors that they had seen a fake patient until after they put their orders in. So we were able to see what would have happened had it been a real patient. So if you go back to Mr. Garrison, for instance, uh, that was the gentleman who was uh, homeless and, um, uh, and hungry. Um, when those uh, doctors put in a lot of orders for CT scans and colonoscopies and so forth, um, we essentially tabulated that all using uh, Medicare cost expenditure data. Um, and we compared that to the cost of uh, the orders placed when the, when the doctors uh, picked up on the context and, you know, put in for Meals on Wheels and social services. And as you can imagine, uh, there was a big difference. Now, obviously, it varied from case to case. But on average, um, uh, it cost about $231 per visit across the cases that we uh, developed, which were all uh, taken from sort of common ambulatory presentations. So that doesn't mean that across uh, the entire uh, health system, it's costing $231 per visit, but it means that this gives you some idea of, for common ambulatory cases, uh, that these are very significant costs. And I will tell you, and you can, again, we have a paper on this, um, that uh, the biomedical errors uh, in those same cases were actually, because uh, we tabulated those up as well, were actually quite a, quite a bit less expensive. Um, uh, you'll be amused if you look at the second citation on this, on this uh, uh, slide here uh, that we called this paper un uncharted territory, uh, measuring cost of diagnostic errors outside the medical record. Again, because if you just looked at the medical record, uh, it was always internally consistent. No, no doctor writes, you know, I missed that comment about the patient saying it's been tough since they've lost their job. Uh, they don't know that, of course, so it's not in the note. They just say that that person's asthma's gotten worse, and so they stepped up therapy. So let's talk a little bit about why these errors occur. Um, well, if you think about it, contextualizing care is a two-step process. First, you have to notice uh, the clue. We call that the contextual red flag. When a patient says, boy, it's been tough since I lost my job, you have to notice that and say, wow, well, I'm sorry to hear that. How has it been tough since you've lost that, your job? We call that contextual probing. Secondly, when the patient tells you uh, what the, the contextual factor is, you know, doc, I just can't afford this medication anymore, or doc, I'm having trouble getting food, or doc, I can't read my insulin syringe, whatever it is, that's the point where you have to start saying, okay, is there a way in which we can adapt this care plan uh, so that it will be effective for this individual? So the first step is uh, probing the, the contextual red flag um, and then hearing uh, what the patient says. We call that the contextual factor that's revealed. And then the second step is adapting the care plan. Uh, we call that contextualizing care. Now, sometimes patients will tell you right up front uh, what their contextual factor is. They're not shy. Um, they're very clear. They'll come and doc, you know, I just can't afford this medication. Or, you know, I'm, I'm just hungry. Even in those situations, as I said, it's not a guarantee that the healthcare provider is going to uh, process what they heard and um, adapt the care plan accordingly. So, so really, contextual errors occur when there's a glitch in, in, in one of those two steps. Um, and again, while this may sound very mechanical, um, there is a compassionate collaborative care framework component to this. This is really about seeing the patient as a person rather than as a disease. Um, it's thinking not just about um, the, the biomedical issues, but what is going on with this person. Um, it's hearing comments like, boy, it's been tough since I've lost my job, and not just thinking, oh, I'm supposed to say something sympathetic here, but wow, I better find out more. So it really is, um, to a substantial degree, related to how you're thinking about the person in front of you. And I think that's a really important point. So um, as I mentioned, we went on to do this with real patients. And we started um, uh, essentially by um, uh, inviting uh, 600 real patients to carry concealed audio recorders into their visits. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and of course, all of this is IRB approved work. And I can talk um, at some length about how we, how we did this. Um, again, physicians knew that they would be audio recorded by some of their real patients. They didn't know um, which ones. Now, um, uh, we also had permission to look at the chart um, uh, uh, from these patients and also to follow uh, them for up to nine months after the index visit so we could see how they did. Now, if you think about it, there's one very important difference here. Because these are real patients, we had no idea what was going to happen. They weren't scripted. And in fact, we didn't even know if there were going to be contextual issues. So that was something we were able to study. And what proportion of these visits are there actual, even, actually even contextual red flags and contextual factors? Because we couldn't just use a checklist, um, um, which is what you do when you know what the script is going to be, we actually had to devise a coding system for listening to real audio recordings and tracking whether there is a contextual red flag. If so, does the physician probe it? If so, is there a contextual factor? If so, is it actually um, addressed in the care plan? And we, uh, we called this coding system 
4C, which stands for Content Coding for Contextualization of Care. And we developed it to a point where it had 90% um, inter-rater reliability. So different people trained to code the same audio have a 90% probability of coding whether the physician, in fact, contextualized the care plan or whether there was a contextual error. So, and as I mentioned, after coding these visits, we then followed the patients uh, for a number of months to see um, how they did. So this is, uh, as you can see, a setup for a great um, prospective study. So you can code each encounter as either contextualized or whether there's a contextual error. And then using a blinded methodology, you can ask another uh, part of your team to track those patients for uh, six to nine months and see how they do and then see if there's a relationship between whether the care plan was contextualized and uh, how they ended up doing uh, for whatever the index presentation was. So let's take an example of that here. So we've got um, a patient named Ms. Geller. This is a real patient, but not a real name. And she presented with loss of control of diabetes. When she came in, her hemoglobin A1C was 9.7, which is very poorly controlled diabetes. It used to be 7, which is much better controlled. And essentially, uh, she revealed that she had moved recently and that her meds got, quote, all messed up. We heard this on the audio. The physician does not acknowledge the problem or provide a list of meds and dosages or refer a patient to a pharmacist to review meds. He just adds more medication. This is coded as a contextual error. Now, not surprisingly, four months later, the hemoglobin A1C isn't better. It's 9.8. And uh, that may sound very obvious to you, um, but um, it was still useful to see that um, simply um, providing sort of the biomedically appropriate care but not addressing the contextual factors, not surprisingly, resulted in a bad outcome. So. Um, what happened uh, across this large cohort of patients when we followed them? Um, I want to step back here uh, and um, give you some key findings. And these are drawn from both our unannounced standardized patient research as well as from our, um, our real patient research. So the first bullet point is that in about 40% of real ambulatory visits, effective care depends on identifying and addressing patient context. So in about 40% of our visits, we heard these contextual uh, red flags and factors. <laughs> In about 40% of encounters in which care depended on attention to context, so that's 40% of 40%, physicians overlooked the context. Um, there, is, there was a contextual error. And one of the most remarkable things we found was that it did, in fact, predict worse health care outcomes. So um, you know, in the example I just gave you a moment ago, you can see that when the physician uh, failed to pick up on the reason why that patient uh, was not controlled, controlling their diabetes, that there was um, no improvement in their diabetes control. Conversely, when the physician picked up on the fact that the patient said their meds were all mex messed up, um, uh, got them appropriate um, uh, sort of diabetes education, and again, this totally depends on the conversation that follows, in those cases where they were coded as providing contextualized care, uh, that hemoglobin A1C was more likely to come down. And that was true across many, many measures. Um, whatever the, and by the way, we weren't just looking at uh, at biomedical measures. Um, a contextual red flag could be missing appointments. If the physician found out why the patient was missing appointments and addressed it, um, that was coded as contextualized. That patient was less likely to miss appointments and so on and so forth. Bullet point number three, contextual errors result in overuse and misuse of medical services with higher costs. Well, again, that goes back to the example of Mr. Garrison. If you don't pick up on the context, um, you're essentially not figuring out why that patient isn't really doing well, um, and you're probably going to order a lot of extra tests and studies, and that drives up costs. And that's important because the concept of contextual error seems a little abstract to people, particularly because it's hard to find in the chart. So uh, showing that it has a lot of dollars and cents attached to it, I think, is impactful. Fourth bullet point, physicians vary greatly in their attention to patient context, even when seeing the same patient. Now, this one, of course, uh, was a finding from sending um, unannounced standardized patients. I think it's worth talking here a little bit about the difference between the two methodologies. Um, from the standpoint of a health services researcher, sending unannounced standardized patients out is known as an experimental research method, whereas listening in on audio recordings made by real patients is an observational method. Um, if you think about experimental methods, it's kind of like rats and mazes. Essentially, you're able to control all the parameters that you want except the one that you're interested in studying. In this case, we were able to send many doctors the same patient, something you could never really do in real life. Um, with the observational method, of course, we were now no longer able to compare physician to physician with the same case, but we were able to see what happens with real patients and real care. So that's why the blend here is so significant. 
The last bullet point is probably the one uh, that I found most surprising. Addressing context during an encounter to avoid a contextual error does not lengthen the visit. And that's something I want to repeat. Um, this is not about how much time you have with the patient. Now, that isn't to say that doctors don't have enough time with patients or other healthcare providers. But it is to, what it is saying is that uh, given equal conditions, some doctors will use that time to contextualize care and others won't. We know this because we had timestamps um, on, uh, on these audio recordings. And when we sent exactly the same patient to different doctors and we coded the care plan as contextualized or contextual error, on average, there was no difference in the amount of time. Now, that may sound counterintuitive, particularly because when I used to give this presentation, one of the most common things that I would hear is, you know, um, this stuff about contextualizing care is all very well and good, but we just don't have time for this. There's no time. And I would point out to them that actually um, their peers who did in fact contextualize care had on average the same length of visit. And when you listen to these audio recordings, you start to hear why. If you go back again to the first example of um, the, uh, the patient with asthma, so as you can imagine, um, if you pick up on that clue, boy, it's been tough since I've lost my job, and you ask about it, and you find out the patient can't afford their medication, and that there's a cheaper alternative, you're home free. Uh, that visit isn't going to be very long, because now you know what's going on. You're going to switch them to a, a, a cheaper medicine. If you don't figure it out, uh, you're going to be spending time uh, talking to them about stepping up therapy and ordering other tests and so forth. Um, so it could conceivably be, end up being a longer visit. Turns out it'll, it's a wash. Contextualizing care has more to do with how you think about the way you practice, how you look at the patient, what type of information you think is significant, rather than simply how much time you have. So, of course, what we want to ask ourselves now is, can clinicians improve at contextualizing care? Well, we've looked at this from a few different perspectives. First, we tried traditional direct instruction. Um, we've actually done two studies here. One was a randomized controlled trial of an educational intervention to improve contextualization of care. Um, essentially, we started by trying this out with um, medical students, M4 students, and uh, then again, uh, we repeated the study with residents. So what did we find? Well, with M4 students, we caught them during their uh, sub-internship, uh, which uh, for those of you who are familiar with medical education is kind of um, the last step before you graduate from medical school. Um, you're seeing real patients with a little bit of supervision. You're functioning a lot like an intern. We embedded in that a curriculum on contextualizing care. We actually had them re revisit their patients uh, the next morning um, and take a contextual history and uh, really give them on hand exposure to identifying contextual red flags and seeing you know, that aha moment that, wow, we really missed the boat here. Um, and recognizing that they need to really adapt their care plan to contextual factors if the patient is going to do well. And um, so we tested those uh, students using standardized patients in the laboratory. So they knew they were being tested. And we had, again, had a, a control group of students who didn't go through this. And uh, happily, uh, the students who had, had gone through this uh, workshop uh, program did, in fact, do a better job um, as measured by standard, uh, standardized patient care. But as you can imagine, there's a bit of a Hawthorne effect here. They knew they were being tested and they knew what they were being tested about. And so uh, this was really a measure of skill, not a measure of performance. Remember, performance is what people do when they're just doing their job. Skill is what they can do when they know they're being tested. So we repeated this with residents. But with residents, not only did we uh, take them through this workshop and, again, have a control group, not only did we assess them with standardized patients, um, uh, where, again, we found that there was um, a, a skills gain, um, but then we also invited the real patients to um, covertly record them, and we coded that data. And uh, unfortunately, what we found is that they kind of found that fell back to their old ways, and that um, uh, the, the, the skill improvement that we saw um, was not uh, maintained uh, once they were actually assessed uh, caring for real patients. And I think this, while disappointing, shouldn't surprise. You can't fix um, a profound um, issue in, in healthcare education, which is this tremendous biomedical focus, with uh, basically a, a workshop series. It's just not enough. You can change skill, but you can't change performance that easily. So um, let's talk a little bit now about um, the concept of audit and feedback. Audit and feedback is just what it sounds. Um, it's a well-established method for changing how people behave. Uh, by essentially checking in on them and then giving them data on how they're doing in some area where they're actually performing rather than just being tested. Uh, we invited about 1,000 patients to carry audio recorders into their visits. We did this over a, this actually went on for a couple of years. And um, we used our same method of coding the data 
Um, but this time, instead of just using it to measure things, we actually tried to use it to improve performance. We fed the data back to uh, the providers. We started by just doing this with physicians, but then we started to expand. So just picture how this worked. When we had this going in full force, we would actually invite patients to carry an audio recorder into their visit before they even approached the front desk clerk. And uh, what would happen is uh, they would approach the front desk um, carrying this audio recorder. And um, you know you can consider two scenarios. One is the, the, the clerk uh, who says, you know, you're late for your appointment. Um, uh, if, let me see if the doctor can still see you. Um, you know, um, you're probably going to have to wait until the last patient's been seen, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's sort of, um, unfortunately, a pretty common scenario, at least in the clinics I've worked in. Um, on the other hand, there were also clerks who would say, wow, Mr. Jones, I know you've um, had a tough time getting here. Um, are you having a problem, you know, um, making it to this particular appointment time or, or something along those lines? And uh, Mr. Jones might reply, yeah, you know, um, oh, it could be anything, right? It could be I, I, I get off late, I have worked a night shift, whatever it is. And uh, the clerk would say, oh, wow, well, you know, how about, you know, uh, Mr. A doctor, Dr. Smith has a, a, an appointment time uh, later in the day or could see you tomorrow at a different time at future visits, would that work for you? So now you can see how the, the, the clerk in this case is essentially contextualizing the interaction. They're probing, they're picking up on the red flags, they're probing, and so forth. Now we would track this all the way through the trajectory of the visit. Um, and at every point we would code for contextual red flags and so forth. We would generate reports um, and then um, hand those reports back to the care team. We remove people's names. It's not about embarrassing people. In fact, if you want to change practice, people have to feel very, very safe with the data. And, and the whole idea here is that you can improve practice um, uh, quite significantly if you're sort of holding a mirror up to people by giving them feedback um, so they realize that this isn't really somebody else's performance problem. It's an issue for them as well. I'll also say that it's very important to give people positive feedback as well as negative Many fantastic examples of contextualizing uh, these interactions at the level of the clerical staff, um, the, uh, the nurses, the physicians, and we, we, we always provide, um, we try to balance it actually between positive and constructive feedback. We also give them uh, um, actually uh, very uh, short summaries of each interaction um, so that they can see for themselves how we coded it. Um, so they can feel free to disagree with us. But you know, I think when they look at the way we code, uh, they see from the examples that in fact, yeah, that really was a red flag. I missed it. Yeah, that really was a factor. I missed it. Yeah, that really was uh, not a contextualized care plan or vice versa. So um, how did this work out? Well, um, what I want to show you here is um, kind of a, a trend graph. And we actually, this is from one particular um, uh, uh, group of uh, pro providers. Um, if, you're, if you're outside the VA, you might call it a medical home team. If you're in the VA, you might call it a patient, patient aligned care team. But essentially, we have, we have a group of providers here. And um, essentially trending them over time. And what you can see is the green line, which is um, their uh, contextual probing rate, and then uh, the, the blue line, which is the contextualization of care rate. So if you remember, I told you that first you've got to probe the contextual red flag, and then you have to incorporate it into the care plan. And what you can see here is that there wasn't that much improvement. Um, they went from 40 to about 48% over the time of this graph um, at uh, improving their tendency to probe context. Um, but there was a significant improvement from about 45% to 70%, actually very dramatic here, um, in their contextualizing the care plan. And for those who are sort of staring at this gra graph and are astute about it, you might ask, well, how could the blue line go up if the green line isn't going up? And the reason is that, um, quite frankly, um, patients are often uh, very open about their contextual challenge, their contextual factors. And so what you see with the blue line is physicians were getting, and other healthcare providers were getting better at simply hearing the contextual factors that were simply announced by patients that didn't even need it to be a probe and addressing them in the care plan. They weren't improving that much at contextual probing. I think also it's important to realize that what we have here is a very powerful tool. It's a tool for tracking the performance of, of healthcare providers in a critical performance um, area that, is, uh, that has previously or otherwise been pretty elusive um, and hard to measure. So. Um, Let's talk uh, briefly about some of the lessons here um, about caring from concealed audio recordings. Um, I think first um, that caring is more than simply making empathic comments like, I'm sorry about your job loss. It's a cognitive skill. And you know what's interesting is uh, the people who do the coding for me uh, mostly come from the theater community. Actually, what happened is um, in my uh, initial uh, set of studies where I was using unannounced standardized patients, I got to know a lot of actors 
Um, they went undercover and did this work. They became very, very good at it. They had a deep knowledge of context. So then when we got funded to start using real patients, we hired actors and trained them to be coders. Um, and uh, one of the things that strikes me the most is none of these people are healthcare professionals, but they're very, very good at coding for context. They have very high inter-rater agreement. And what they say all the time is when they listen to these audio recordings, it's so frustrating to them that, that, that the, the doctor doesn't say, what do you mean it's been tough since you lost your job? Or tell me about, um, uh, about, uh, about why you think you've lost control of your diabetes. I mean, it's basically not asking these so-called um, evident questions. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, is really uh, a key lesson here, that one of the core dimensions of caring, one of the ways you show you care is by listening carefully and then asking the right question, asking a question to understand what's going on with that person better. Um, so it's looking for signs that a person is struggling, asking questions until you understand why, and then mobilizing your expertise and resources to help them. That's the second bullet about it. That's just a lay way of saying, noticing the contextual red flag, probing the contextual red flag, listening for the contextual factor, and contextualizing the care plan. That's all it is. Okay, so in sum, contextualizing care begins with asking yourself for every encounter, what is the best next thing for this patient at this time? And I, I want to just talk about why I italicize this. So this patient is really to highlight the fact that every patient is different, that context is what makes us unique. And this time is to highlight that every patient's context changes every day. And so the patient who was not having caretaker issues at the last visit may be having caretaker issues now. The patient who was not having financial problems at the last visit may be having financial issues now. So it's really about re-exploring context every visit when there are clues. I also want to emphasize that this is not going on a wild goose chase. If a patient comes in and everything's going fine, uh, they don't really have any issues managing their care, um, they're here for some simple evident concern that requires a new medication or some counseling, there is no need to start going on a um, contextual probing um, trail. Um, that is not at all the message um, that I'd like to convey. It's really um, being alert at all times for those contextual red flags and then pursuing them when they occur. So um, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, I've been doing a lot of this work with a colleague um, named Alan Schwartz. Um, Alan and I have worked together for uh, wow, I think 12 years at least at this point. Um, Alan is a cognitive psychologist, um, also at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, he works in the Department of Medical Education. He happens to be editor-in-chief of the journal Medical Decision Making, which some of you may read. He's a very, very fine methodologist. And um, we have worked um, as partners uh, for all of these studies. Um, you know, I'm a primary care physician, um, so I can bring the clinical perspective, and he's a methodologist. And uh, we actually have uh, come out with a book about our work, which was just published this year called Listening for What Matters, and then the fine print is Avoiding Contextual Errors in Healthcare, uh, published by Oxford University of Press, um, and uh, it is uh, available um, anywhere where you can buy books, um, from Amazon to Barnes & Nobles or any, any place that, uh, that you like to look for books on. So if you want to hear the whole story, the other thing I'll tell you is that conducting this work is a whole nother adventure. Um, the challenges of audio recording uh, visits is um, uh, fraught with, as you can imagine, hurdles. Um, we talk about those hurdles, how we did this work, um, how we make sure that we're consistent with um, ethical norms, um, how we make sure that uh, patients feel engaged, um, how we make sure that providers feel safe and unthreatened and understand that this is for them, it's not to them. Uh, these are all the types of issues that we've struggled with and um, had to address. Um, we do think that there's a tremendous need to expand the process of directly observing care. Um, I think it's just um, odd that uh, we're spending three trillion dollars on health care um, in this country and nobody's observing it. Um, and so I think that there's just so, so much more work that can be done um, in, in this area. So uh, finally, um, this is the disclaimer. Um, the views expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the position or policy of the Department of Veterans Affairs or uh, the United States government. Thank you, Saul. That was just a fantastic presentation. And I have to say, I've read all your articles and I've read your book. And the book is a really easy, easy to read. I mean, it's written in a conversational tone and it's incredibly interesting. We'll take some questions in a minute. I know Andrea's collecting them for us. But 
I'm, I'm just curious about implications for those of us who don't have the research set up um, that you might have and what we might be able to do in practice as, uh, as clinicians uh, trying to address these issues besides trying to train ourselves. You know, I think you're absolutely right about needing to be observed, needing to have these kinds of tapes so that we can have true audit and feedback, but because it doesn't make it into the chart, how do we do this kind of thing short of audio taping everybody? So I think it's um, an opportunity uh, for personal professional development uh, without any technology. So, you, so one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm finding even in my own practice is that um, it's an opportunity for me to appreciate uh, that uh, here's something I wasn't really taught well in medical school um, and that um, is hugely significant to my patients. Um, and so I need to start getting into the habit of paying attention to these contextual red flags and asking about them. Um, now, that is, uh, that's sort of a lifelong opportunity for uh, any healthcare professional. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, it kind of covers the spectrum from those who are meeting patients at the front desk to those who are uh, seeing them in the clinic. I think the larger question which you're getting at is how do we turn this into um, something that we begin routinely measuring? Um, I do think that uh, um, there is going to have to be um, almost a groundswell of interest in um, recording visits and in using that data uh, to assess care. Um, I, I think that uh, in my own institution, we've certainly developed a culture of doing that largely because of, of the teams I work with. Um, I think that it's actually more about culture than technology. I mean, right now, everybody has an iPhone and anybody can, rec uh, can record um, anything. Um, but um, I think that if uh, there are individuals who are interested in actually setting this up um, in a more structured way at their own organization, um, I would be happy to um, assist them directly to sort of be a free consultant um, because I do think this is very important. Um, and I think that um, it's something that uh, most, uh, most institutions just haven't thought that much about. Mm -hmm. One more question and then we'll get to the uh, audience questions. Have you had any consideration of putting any of these factors into electronic health records? Well, um, I, I think uh, if I understand, uh, you're suggesting that these could be uh, fed into the electronic health record um, as a way of priming healthcare providers to be more aware of them. Um, mm -hmm. And it's actually funny you should mention that. Um, we've been doing some research in that area. Actually, a colleague of mine who's picked up on this uh, has, been, has developed an inventory for patients to complete in the waiting room um, and then uh, hand that to the doctor um, uh, to uh, see if just uh, essentially putting it in front of the physician will prime them to pick up on context. What we're finding is that physicians often don't look at it um, when it's handed to them. So now we're actually developing a proposal to see if this can actually built into, be built into clinical decision support. Um, so mm -hmm. clinical decision support for those who are, who are not clinicians are, you know, are those pops up, pop ups and other sort of info, information items that appear in the medical record that are intended to prompt the doctor. Uh, to vaccinate somebody or tell them about the importance of quitting smoking. We think that those technologies could be used to prime the doctor, you know, hey, this patient hasn't been refilling their medication, or, you know, uh, this patient has told us that they can't afford their medication, or whatever it is, and make, mm -hmm. basically having that pop up in the chart. And I think there's a huge opportunity to begin to do that work. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was curious about. Okay, well, let's turn over to Andrea so we can see what some of the questions are that have come up from the audience. Andrea? Yes, thanks, Beth. Uh, we have a number of questions, but before we begin, a reminder to our audience, if you have a question to submit, you may still do so. Just type your question into the questions pane, and we will answer as many as we can in the time remaining. So let's jump into some of our audience questions. Our first question is, how do you deal with the challenge of knowing what matters to the healthcare provider and realizing that it does not matter to the patient? Uh, or in other words, who decides what matters most when a patient is non-adherent to the plan of care? So I think that uh, that's a great question. I think that there's a subtle um, distinction between patient preference and patient context. And just to step back briefly, I think there are four types of information you need to provide good care. One is you need information about the patient's clinical state. What's their diagnosis? What do the lab tests show? You also need information about the research evidence. So um, what, what, do, what do the studies show about how you treat this condition? Then if there are choices to be made, uh, you need to know what the patient's preferences are. Does the patient prefer this or that? Um, and those often have to do with uh, values. Um, and then the fourth is um, 
are there contextual issues, things going on in that patient's life that may be relevant to why they're not taking their medicine uh, and that they may not even appreciate. So I think if a patient is not taking their medicine when they're supposed to, you need to figure out, is this a preference issue or is this a context issue? If the patient has just decided that they would rather have their symptoms uh, than the potential side effects of the medication, that's a preference issue. Uh, but if the patient is taking their medication because they're confused about it, they don't understand it, they can't take it as they're supposed to because of conflicting needs, that's a context issue. So I think a key thing is to figure out which it is, preferences or context. Okay, terrific. Um, it looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, our final question is, are you recommending that providers implement these types of programs in our practices? And if so, how do you advise dealing with resistance from the providers who don't want to participate? Well, first of all, I'd like to make myself available um, to those who are interested in, in contacting me. I think you have my email. It's s-w-e-i-n-e-r at u-i-c dot e-d-u. Um, if I don't answer right away, I will follow up. Um, I think that uh, it's all about how this is communicated to, to physicians and other healthcare providers. Um, you really want to begin by bringing them together um, and making them own this. Um, and this ha it has to be clear that this is not being done to them. This is for them. You bring them together and you say, look, um, these recordings are going to be um, going just to you. Uh, they're not going to have identifiers. And we're going to make sure that this is really just a way for you to see um, how you can improve. Um, and it's not going to go to your bosses. It's not going to be used for, for, for performance pay. So that's really um, a culture and trust issue um, and something that I'd be happy to talk with um, for those who are interested. All right. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Wiener. That wraps up our Q&A session for today. Beth, any final thoughts to share with our participants? Well, I'd actually just like to really thank Dr. Wiener for, for uh, sharing his, his incredible work with us. I think it's really important. I especially appreciated what you've said, Saul, about uh, this being a practical form of compassion and uh, this notion of opening ourselves to listening, uh, to paying attention, to being curious is just the essential um, foundation of being a good clinician. Uh, so thank you for uh, offering your thoughts and your expertise. Really, really appreciate it. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Terrific. I, I would again like to thank Dr. Wiener for sharing his expertise and insights with us, as well as everyone in the audience for setting aside time in your busy day to participate. We hope that you will join us for upcoming programs in the Compassion in Action webinar series, including Sustainable Compassion for Health Professionals with Dr. Brooke Lavelle on October 4th. Please visit our website to learn more about the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare and our membership program. Also, a reminder, on October 28th through the 29th, 2016, we will be holding the Harvard Medical School Continuing Education course, Compassion in Practice, Achieving Better Outcomes by Maximizing Communication, Relationships, and Resilience. Registration information is available on our website. We know you are very busy, but we would very much appreciate your taking a moment to complete the electronic survey upon exiting today's program as we value your input. Thank you, and have a great day.